Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's installment of the Wednesday webinar series. Today's topic is fair code to route development. My name is Antonella Salmeron and I am the host for today. Before I pass it to our presenters, I have a few housekeeping items. Our speakers will share their knowledge with us for the first part of the presentation and will reserve the remaining time for any questions that you might have. Today, we're requesting that you uh, add your questions to the Q&A function on Zoom. I will read your questions out loud in the order received at the very end of the presentation. And if we are unable to address all of the questions, we'll send an email reply after the webinar. Also, feel free to use the chat if you have any technical issues with the platform today. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on Hot Exchange shortly following the webinar. The slides will also be available on Hot Exchange after the webinar. Immediately following the webinar, you will receive an invitation to complete a survey on today's webinar, and we ask that you please complete this with any feedback that you might have for us. With that, I'll pass it over to Will. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope everyone is well. Thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar on Faircloth to RAD development, which we're particularly excited to uh, update given some recent changes made through the RAD supplemental notice uh, published a few weeks ago. Let's get started. Um, so just a reminder, there's a quite a number of really helpful uh, uh, webinars that HUD's published through this series. They're all available online on, on HUD Exchange. Uh, you'll see a quick listing of them up top. And of course, HUD will continue to develop new webinars based on needs. Um, so, so please let us know if there are topic areas that, um, that, that you think would be useful for us to cover. Uh, today, um, uh, I will be uh, uh, kicking off the presentation. Um, I, my name is Will Levy. I work in the Office of Recapitalization that administers the rental assistance demonstration, as well as other programs. Um, I'll also be joined by my colleague, Stacey Harrison, who's one of our uh, uh, leaders in the Faircloth to Rad world, as well as our colleague, uh, Nick Burke in the Office of Public Housing Investments, um, who uh, who's, who's uh, uh, among our, our, our great partners in, in the Fair Cloth to Rad effort. Uh, so the goal of this webinar is to introduce the concept of Fair Cloth to Rad. We'll start at the beginning and how housing authorities can use it to build and preserve deeply affordable housing in their communities. Um, this is a really great opportunity to actually expand the deeply affordable housing footprint in this country. Uh, we're going to provide an overview of the Faircloth to Rad development process and highlight even a few examples of how PHAs are using Faircloth. Um, uh, so HUD un, um, uh, rolled out the Faircloth to Rad uh, about, uh, about two years ago um, uh, by uh, essentially merging two processes, the Rad development process and um, uh, the mixed finance or the rad conversion process and, and mixed finance development, um, uh, and it was uh, primarily done just by working together within HUD to uh, figure out how to how to layer these two things on top of one another. Um, uh, uh, so uh, a, a really neat innovation that we hope to continue to build on, and, and we're really excited about the response from housing authorities um, uh, yeah, eager to expand their affordable housing footprint. Uh, start, starting with some background, what is Faircloth? Uh, so uh, um, we, always, we always use Faircloth as shorthand, but it was, it's uh, the origin story um, is uh, when Congress was enacting QARA in 1998, 1998, the Quality Housing and Work Responsibility Act uh, there's an amendment by, made by the recently departed uh, Senator Locke Faircloth of North Carolina, which capped uh, the number of public housing units HUD could support as the number of units a PHA had uh, at a certain date in 1999, October 1st, 1999. Um, so uh, we've colloquially come to just refer to these as Faircloth units, but, but that's, the, the, that's the origin. Um, uh, uh, 
any units a PHA demolishes or removes through Section 18, um, including those Section 18 units that are, that are in a RAD Section 18 blend, remain in a PHA's Faircloth authority. In PHA's Faircloth authority, so they have the, they actually have the statutory authority to to rebuild them as public housing or to rebuild those public housing units and replace them. Uh, any units converted through RAD are no longer counted as part of a PHA's Faircloth authority. It's it's uh, permanently reduced. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we get this question a lot. PH, uh, PHA's Faircloth authority is retained uh, even if a PHA is no, no longer has any public housing units. So there's about two or 300 housing authorities across the country who through various efforts in whether um, uh, 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 through section 18 or other reasons um, uh, no longer have any public housing units, but they might still actually have uh, a Faircloth authority. So as long as they haven't closed out of their public housing program, um, actually terminated the public housing ECC, um, they still retain their Faircloth authority. Um, uh, anybody can look up how many Faircloth units a PHA has. We uh, HUD updates this about once a year. Um, uh, it's on the Office of Capital Improvements website. Um, we'll share these slides afterwards, so you can click the live links um, and and you can look up uh, uh, how many available Faircloth units uh, a housing authority has. A few other notes, if a PHA has used one of the tools that requires it to close out, so in the last few years, HUD's rolled out programs like Streamlined Voluntary Conversion, um, a Section 18 option for PHAs 50 and under, small PHA, RAD and Section 18 blends, all of these say, if you use these tools, you are committing to closing out your public housing program. HUD has recently determined that um, even if a PHA has used one of those tools, the PHA may still develop their remaining fair cloth to uh, their remaining fair cloth units through fair cloth to RAD uh, prior to closing out their pu public housing program. That is, that is part of the, the close out of their public housing program. Um, however, again, as I noted, if you've already closed out your public housing program, which, which very few agencies have done, um, but, but if, if that's happened uh, and you've terminated the public housing annual contributions contract, your um, you, PHA no longer has the ability to replace those fair cloth units. Uh, and there on the screen is the number of fair cloth units, at least as of uh, a few months ago. The number is probably a little bit higher now, actually, because there have been more Section 18 actions since and, and, and that have not uh, been offset by new fair cloth development. Um, uh, but if that's the this here on the screen, two, over 249,878 units that um, uh, if housing authorities build under the public housing process, HUD will fund. Um, so this is a, a HUD, HUD will fund, it will turn on operating fund and capital fund subsidy for them. Um, uh, uh, so this is a, a, a tremendous opportunity to um, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, create new affordable housing. Of course, a, a big challenge is actually developing the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the financing to, to put that together. And that's why Fair Cloth to Red was developed um, to um, uh, by merging the um, mixed finance development process and the RAD conversion, the, the, the uh, uh, confirmation that once built, the property can be converted um, to a Section 8 contract that at least helps to arrange some of the financing uh, needed to get the property built in the first place. Um, so that is the, 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 the basic premise of, of Fair Cloth to RAD. And with that, I'll turn to my colleague, Stacey Harrison, to uh, provide an overview of the Fair Cloth to RAD process. Thank you, Will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so let's start just with a general overview of the Fair Cloth, Fair Cloth to RAD process from start to end. Next slide. So we like to think of this process as having three major parts. First is the pre-development phase. This is when the PHA is putting their project plans together. Uh, PHA begins with a NAR request through the RAD resource desk. And then when plans have fully taken shape, the PHA submits, submits a mixed finance development proposal to the Office of Public Housing Investments or OPHI. After their review, OPHI will issue the mixed finance approval letter and shortly thereafter, the uh, Office of Recap issues a RAD conversion 
conditional approval or RCCA. Next, the project enters the construction phase. This is the longest phase of the whole process where the project is being built or rehabbed over several months. HUD is generally hands off during this time, but the Office of Recap will check in periodically on the progress of the construction work. Then at about 60 days prior to completion, we will invite the PHA to a construction completion meeting over Teams to encourage the PHA to prepare documents that will uh, be needed for the actual DOFA date and the RAD closing. And we'll answer any questions the PHA has about the RAD closing process. Uh, finalizing the actual DOFA date in the PIC system is handled by the PIH field office. And that's our cue to know that the project is ready for conversion. So when the field office has entered the actual DOFA date and PIC, the Office of Recap will quickly issue the RAD chat and the RAD conversion commitment almost simultaneously so the PHA can proceed to an efficient closing. Upon closing, the RAD PBV or PBRA HAP contract and the RAD use agreement are in effect. Next slide. Let's um, now get into the details of that process. Um, uh, and all those steps, we'll start with requesting the notice of anticipated RAD rents or the NAR. Um, so the NAR will reserve uh, the proposed fair cloth to RAD units under the RAD cap. It provides RAD contract rents the PHA can then use to secure sources of financing that lenders can rely on for underwriting purposes. Uh, PHAs can request the NAR through the RAD resource desk. Uh, when you log in, you'll go to action items and then select fair cloth conversion reservation. And requesting a NAR does not commit you to pursuing the project, you can request an R just to test the feasibility of a project and it doesn't expire. Uh, RAD rents for Faircloth units are initially based on the operating fund and capital fund levels for new units. And these rents are locked in, so they're not subject to continued uncertainty or uh, funding fluctuations in public housing cap and op fund appropriations. So a few things the resource desk will prompt you to provide when requesting the NAR the property expense level estimator or the PEL estimator is a short one page form that assists HUD with the operating fund portion of the rent calculation. Uh, within that form, and as well as a few form fields right on the resource desk, uh, we need some property specifics, which can be uh, assumptions based on your project plans at that time and may change. Uh, so we're looking for project specific data, data that includes items such as unit configuration, unit count, uh, the property zip code, uh, pick number for a comparable project, whether it's uh, in the PHA's portfolio, or if the PHA doesn't have a public housing portfolio, or um, uh, the projects in their portfolio really are not comparable to the project they're proposing under the fair cloth to RAD conversion, we will accept a, a pick number if you have a neighboring PHA with a property that would be more suitable. Uh, we also like to know the date of the expected Mike's finance development submission that just generally gives us a sense for your timing. And next slide. So this slide pertains to uh, projects where the PHA is contemplating fair cloth to RAD for existing projects that are currently occupied. The RAD supplemental notice prescribes resident notice and meeting requirements for occupied projects, but for now I just want to focus um, and highlight the resident meeting and notice requirements for requesting the NAR. Um, in these scenarios, the RIN um, would, will always be uh, required for existing occupied projects. Uh, the, RIN, the RIN stands for resident information notice. This is a standard RAD um, resident notice that informs residents of their rights under the RAD program. Um, the nature of project plans, whether any relocation is anticipated, and a description of resident meetings to be held. The GIN, uh, a general information notice, um, is sometimes required, and in scenarios where the project will involve acquisition or substantial rehab or demolition, uh, this notice would provide a description of the project and activities planned and any relocation assistance that may be available. So they sound similar um, but there's distinct requirements for each one, and our RAD Notice Revision 4 provides more detail on the content of those notices if that applies to your particular project. Um, and so for PHAs with 
uh, prior RAD conversion experience, you'll find that the sequencing and timing of RAD engagement activities is a familiar process um, as the project goes through HUD review and approval. Um, so come back to this slide as reference, but for now, I just wanted to call your attention to the resident notice and two meeting requirements that um, have to occur prior to a NAR request for projects that are existing occupied buildings. Next slide, please. Okay, fair cloth to rad rent flexibility. So fair cloth to rad rents tend to be about 10 to 20% lower than regular rad rents. And this is due to the low capital fund portion of rent given the anticipated DOFA date for the new project. So regular RAD projects have a higher capital fund subsidy amount because of the property age and condition. Since the implementation of fair cloth to RAD, MTW agencies have had the flexibility to augment fair cloth to RAD rents with MTW funds. And now with the publication of the RAD supplemental notice, non-MTW agencies can augment fair cloth to RAD rents for PVV conversions using existing voucher reserves under certain circumstances. The supplemental also allows PHAs to use the opportunity zone rent boost for PBRA fair cloth to rad transactions where the project is located in an opportunity zone and other rent flexibilities under rad, including uh, rent bundling, RHF and DDTF rent offset um, are now um, options. Slide. So as an illustration, this slide shows the typically low fair cloth to RAD rent on the left with the estimated cap and op fund subsidy of $350 plus uh, the tenant rent of 318 for a total of $668, which is well below the maximum initial contract rent or the dotted line at the top that's 110% of FMR. Um, so you can see in the column on the right, the PHA can use $388 of um, uh, to um, from their voucher reserves to make up the difference in order to make this project financially feasible. Next slide. And to further illustrate the benefits of using fair cloth to red, the new column that appeared on the far right shows that without the new HAP subsidy generated by the use of the fair cloth to red or that $350 in the red box, um, the PHA would otherwise be using $738 from existing voucher authority or reserves to bring a new project online. Slide. So when augmenting rents uh, for non-MTW agencies, um, there are two conditions which must be met in order for a project to be eligible. First, the project may be subject to a limitation on the number of fair cloth to rad units in the project receiving the rent boost. So this limitation mirrors income mixing requirements typically seen in regular PVB housing as shown under number one and items A and B. However, the project is exempt from this limitation if the units are exclusively available to the elderly or people who are eligible for supportive services or youth receiving family unification assistance. Note that being eligible for supportive services is as defined by the PHA a few examples of these services would include meal services, housekeeping aid, uh, transportation services, health-related services, child care, education, or employment services. The notice does not require that families be receiving these services, but only that they need to be eligible. To demonstrate eligibility under this criteria, the PHA will certify on the resource desk when requesting the NAR or the rent augmentation. Second, on the right, uh, the condition that has to be met um, here is with respect to local rental vacancy rates or localities with high small area FMRs. And RECAP is working on automating the eligibility check for this condition on the resource desk, which should be available in the next couple of weeks. Um, but just as background, HUD has uh, market at a glance reports available on HUDuser.gov that are publicly available and anybody can review. You can pull an MSA report that will show American community service data from the Census Bureau that reflects local vacancy rates uh, for the last three years of available data. Currently, the data for years uh, that we have is for 2019 through 2021. And we're expecting that data for 2022 will be available by the end of this calendar year. So if you go and look at that, you'll see that the most recent data um, is, is going back to 2021. 
Um, however, due to fluctuations local markets, if the vacancy rate for any of those three years is less than 4%, then the property will meet this criteria. Alternatively, if the small area FMR um, as compared to the metro FMR, it, this, this comparison is a bit more straightforward. And if the property meets um, this second condition, they'll be eligible for the um, rent augmentation. This is also an uh, um, eligibility check that we're building into the red resource desk to be automatic. Um, However, if neither of these two conditions can be met based on the data we have available, then the PHA can submit an independent analysis showing the rental vacancy area is less than 4%. We'll also accept a market study that a PHA has already obtained for either low-income housing tax credits or other financing application that the project has. In the meantime, while we're finalizing those resource desk updates, PHAs can uh, reach out to the RECAP office directly if you want to check eligibility for non-MTW rent augmentation using HAP reserves. Next slide. Budgeting for rent augmentation. Um, so HUD will provide new incremental voucher funding for the first full calendar year following conversion using the base NAR rents before any rent augmentation amount is applied. So this means that the first year after RAD conversion, when a property um, is complete, the PHA will receive new HCB funding only for the base NAR rent. The PHA will use HAP reserves to cover the rent augmentation for that 12 month period. Depending on whether a PHA is an MTW or a non-MTW agency will determine how you should budget for that rent augmentation. So for the 39 original MTW agencies, the augmentation of fair cloth through ad rents must be budgeted for in the annual MTW funding or reserves. And for MTW um, expansion agencies or non-MTW agencies, um, you'll need to withhold voucher funding um, to fund the augmentation only in the first full year after conversion. Beginning that second year, full year after conversion, the full contract amount, including the rent augmentation, it will be picked up in the HAP renewal baseline. So in other words, uh, legacy MTW agencies, the new and renewed funding amount every year after a fair cloth to rent project comes online will only be increased by the amount of the new HAP subsidy from the NAR um, base rents. For non-MTW agencies and um, expansion agencies, um, funding is renewed based on expenditures. So the HAP reserves uh, in year one after conversion get picked up in renewal funding in addition to the uh, base NAR rents. Next slide. So a few notes on the MTW program requirement that agencies must continue to assist substantially the same total number of families as would have been absent the MTW designation. When using MTW funds to augment rents, a subsidy layering review will be conducted as part of the mixed finance development proposal review. And there are a couple considerations to make with respect to STS. Uh, for original MTW agencies, uh, fair cloth to rad units are added to your baseline or the denominator in that calculation. When we conducted an analysis with the MTW office, we found that this could result in a slight reduction in the STS percentage over time, but did not expect to have a significant impact that would be detrimental to the PAJ's compliance with STS requirements. So if you have concerns, we encourage you to discuss this with your MTW coordinator just to confirm that there are no issues. Um, for expansion MTW agencies, the STS methodology includes other factors such as uh, inflation and HCV capacity in the target calculation and assessment that are likely to have less of an impact on the STS compliance. But um, it's always a good idea to check with your MTW coordinator if you have any questions or concerns on that topic. Next slide, augmenting rents. So while the HAP reserve rent augmentation is only available for PBV conversions, the Faircloth to RAD projects that are converting to PBRA can take advantage of the RAD um, opportunity zone rent boost that is up to $100 per unit per month. Um, so this is an existing rent flexibility in section 1.7 of the RAD notice. Um, you can also visit opportunity zones for HUD, at HUD.gov, um, excuse me, opportunityzones.hud.gov for more information. And um, as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, rent flexibilities that were pre-existing, they're also now available to fair cloth to rad conversions, include trading in future RHF or DETF to offsite, uh, offset rent increases and rent bundling. Next slide. Uh, so just to recap, you can request uh, the NAR on the RAD resource desk. We're very close to updating the application page to validate project eligibility criteria for the rent augmentation for non-MTW agencies. Once we receive a NAR request um, that has all the information we need, we coordinate with OPHI to generate the cap and op fund estimates needed for the RAD rents. It's usually a couple weeks before we have those back and can communicate the NAR rents to the PHA, uh, then at that time you can request how to include any desired rent augmentation up to the 110% of FMR limit in the NAR that we uh, would then route for signature. Um, so at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Nick Burke, our colleague in OPHI. He's gonna talk about the mixed finance development proposal process. Nick, I'm just letting you know that we cannot hear you yet. Nick, it seems like we're continuing to have some technical issues with your audio. It's not coming through. Nick, are you there? All right, so maybe do you want me to go through some of the slides until Nick can come on? Yes, please. Thank you, Belinda. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about submitting the mixed finance development proposal. Next slide, please. Okay, as you know, um, on the um, Mixed Finance website, there's the HUD form um, 50157, which is um, the actual development proposal. And um, there's a couple things that we need. We need to make sure that it is marked that you're going to um, do a fair cloth to RAD. It ha you need to tell us whether or not you're going to go RAD PBV or RAD PBRA. Um, the ownership and control documentation needs to match and uh, meet the requirements for um, uh, the, the RAD program. And um, uh, the replacement reserve um, has to either be based on a 20-year capital needs assessment or the 450 units uh, uh, per unit per year calculation. And I will tell you that most of the proposals we've seen um, go ahead and use that floor amount of 450 per unit per year as their minimum. Um, and in throughout the mixed finance development proposal in place of the operating subsidy methodology section um, where you would normally um, put in what your operating uh, contribution would be uh, in this place is where you would um, use the NAR. Um, and we also need um, a, a legal opinion for your pilot, which is to, to know if uh, payment in lieu of taxes is gonna be permitted for this project. So next slide. Okay, and so in um, our workbook, um, our office will also review the subsidy layering requirement, um, and that will be looking at the debt coverage ratio of cash flow. Uh, we'll be looking at um, how that relates over uh, a 15 year period. Um, and that's based on actually firm committed uh, financing documents. Um, pretty pretty standard, um, and we follow the requirements that are published in the Federal Register for subsidy layering review. Next slide. 
Okay, so let's go through the, the whole process. So first, the housing authority needs to submit the NAR request through the RAD resource desk. Um, that then comes over um, to both. It notifies both our office and the recap office. Um, there's usually a preliminary call with um, that includes both the PHA and recap and the OUR grant manager. Um, after that call, the housing authority, um, hopefully after you've kind of explored some of your financing options, right, you'll prepare the development proposal and development calculator um, on specifically for Faircloth to RAD, submit them to our office um, for review. So the grant manager at HUD then would review the development proposal um, and present it to the mixed finance panel. The things that we want to really call out that you need to make sure that you also coordinate on a parallel track is that the HUD field office um, has to conduct a local site and neighborhood standards review. So that review is typically submitted to the PIH director who then submits it over to um, whoever their local um, FHNEO um, offices that services that field office. Um, we want to call out that UFAS accessibility is specifically called out in the mixed finance reg. Um, so make sure that your plans and specs um, have to come in for a review our, our office to make sure that they're in compliance. Um, and of course, your environmental reviews have to be done. Um, HUD then uh, will we'll review and approve the development proposal once all the components and the evidentiary draft evidentiary documents have been reviewed. Um, HUD OGC review also reviews those evidentiary documents. Um, HUD Field Council will look at title and survey. Um, and the field office approves management documents. Because this is fair cloth to rad, we recommend that you really just use our model documents and don't make any heroic, crazy writers that are going to elongate your review time in um, OGC. Um, because at the conversion, all of these documents will be extinguished. However, to meet the requirement that it is, in fact, the public housing unit that's eligible to convert, um, we have to still go through this um, exercise. So HUD will um, approve uh, the PHA's development proposal through um, a letter. Um, we also provide the Office of Recap with a certification memo and a copy of um, the approval letter. Um, they then issue what's called an RCCA um, and the PHA and its partners can move forward to um, close and execute all their evidentiary documents. Um, so once um, the PHA submits and HUD approves the final executed evidentiary documents, which is the um, Office of Urban Revitalization, um, HUD can then release any public housing funds that the PHA may need to construct its projects. Uh, next slide. Okay. So this is just, um, you know, another um, a, a list here. So all um, public housing requirements remain the same. Um, and this is so that no projects will receive more public funding than necessary. Um, you have to comply, again, with site neighborhood standards, accessibility. And again, I want to call out that the mixed finance reg does specifically include uh, the standard of UFAS. Um, RADs, uh, all of the RAD uh, conversion requirements uh, for ownership and other um, items um, are already being contemplated. Um, the subsidy layering review and the operating performer is based on the NAR. Um, the, again, here's the ownership requirements. Uh, the new construction or LITAC, um, the replacement reserve has to be at the floor level unless there's some other um, methodology that you want to, to use, but um, that's based on um, a capital needs assessment. So as I said, for most projects, we see that they just go ahead and use the $450 per unit. Um, and um, the PHA has to make uh, simultaneous submissions both to the RAD resource desk and to our office. And so it's, um, I know it's a little bit 
cumbersome, it sort of seems like, but we have, we thought we were still being very innovative in layering kind of like two programs together in order to help um, put more affordable units on the market. Uh, next slide. Okay. Is this also us? <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah. Okay, so MTW agencies and Faircloth to Red. So MTW agencies can apply many of their flexibilities um, in a RAD conversion. Uh, when we're reviewing um, the development proposal, we would often ask that MTW agency to kind of like point to um, the activity that's been approved in their MTW plan um, that would support any variation to the development process that they want to use. Um, uh, MTW agencies can also apply activities that um, would impact their project-based voucher program and that are approved within their um, MTW agreement, provided that uh, they don't conflict with any of the future RAD requirements. Um, there can be uh, augmentation of Faircloth to RAD rents. Uh, they have to be accounted for each year, either by drawing down reserves or through controlled leasing. Um, and the substantially uh, the same, meeting the same requirements um, need to be um, to met on the baseline. So, okay. And Will, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I think I think this is just a helpful recap of some of the items uh, Stacy walked through earlier. So, but, yeah. Ellen, thank you so much for covering. And and Nick, hope you come back to us soon. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll uh, I'll pick back up now to say so. At the same time, you're 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 submitting the bulk of the the the, the transaction of the the development transaction through the mixed finance development proposal, and you're making the simultaneous transit uh, submission to to uh, on the rad side, uh, but on the rad side, it's a pretty light lift. Um, uh, so, so it's not kind of duplicative, simultaneous underwriting. Um, instead, on the RAD side, we just need some basic information um, to make sure we can uh, uh, check off some of the RAD kind of programmatic compliance matters. So um, the conversion overview um, uh, that, that's submitted with every financing plan, uh, the uh, uh, certification of board approval um, uh, of the RAD conversion, the, um, the PHA plan amendment. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, less common, but for, for MTW agencies that haven't yet um, amended their attachment A of their MTW agreement, um, uh, that that, um, uh, the, the, that part um, is, is handled. I think that's only applicable to the original MTW agencies um, and, and then a title report. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty, it's a very significantly slimmed down financing plan because most of the things that you would have normally uh, given for a RAD conversion are provided in the mixed finance development proposal. Uh, so um, Belinda and Nick Shop are doing the underwriting of the development. Um, uh, and uh, uh, from our point of view, from, from the RAD conversion point of view, we're essentially treating it as a straight conversion. We are anticipating it being a simple conversion of a recently built property, even though we're doing this review upfront before, before it gets built. Um, so, 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 so that allows, that, that's what allows this, this submission to be um, uh, uh, quite simple. Uh, so then we moving on to the construction completion and closing uh, um, uh, steps. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, fundamental kind of constraint or or premise we have in fair cost to rad conversions is that a property is only eligible to be converted as soon as the property is uh, actually public housing, and it's public housing when it reaches. It's a uh, date of funding availability or, 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 or DOFA. Um, uh, the DOFA is achieved when it has a certification of occupancies on 95% of the units. Um, uh, uh, so uh, once uh, you've closed on the mixed finance development um, uh, proposal and you've gotten the RAD conversion com uh, 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 conditional uh, um, approval from us, um, go into construction. 
uh, and um, uh, and uh, you have to essentially come back to us when the property is built. Um, uh, when, as soon as the property is eligible for uh, to get its DOFA, uh, you work with the field office to uh, get the property into PIC. And as soon as it's there, we can get rolling on all of the RAD steps. Um, so uh, if you are trying to convert as quickly as possible, you make sure you can make sure things are teed up um, uh, uh, actually before the before you hit DOFA. As as construction is is winding down, um, you can a update any financing plan materials. Right, if you need to modify some of the uh, your sources and uses to update uh, closing transaction costs or something uh, something like that, um, you can do so there. You can also begin to prepare and upload closing documents um, uh, if you want, such that as soon as you hit DOFA, the property hits DOFA, um, uh, 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 we can we can we can get to conversion. We can actually uh, uh, convert it over to a Section Eight contract. Um, uh, one of the uh, things we're often asked is is how um, uh, uh, how, how to handle leasing um, once the property is built. Of course, you're, 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 uh, a lot of PHAs have, have two motivations. One is to convert as quickly as possible to get over to a Section 8 contract because that was the intent and that's how lenders are, and investors probably un understood the transaction. Um, but also uh, you need to lease up the property to, um, uh, uh, to, to satisfy tax credit uh, requirements or, or, other, or, or other local requirements. Um, uh, so many PHAs uh, try to complete the conversion before they start leasing. Sometimes that's just not possible. But um, uh, the RAD supplemental notice provided additional uh, direction on um, the, the resident notification and engagement requirements in either scenario. So if tenants are admitted to the property after the RAD conversion, once it's already uh, under a Section 8 com contract, there's no specific RAD notification requirements. You are simply admitting families into the Section 8, to the Section 8 property um, with all the rights and protections uh, built into uh, to a, to a RAD Section 8 contract. If on the other hand, you need to admit residents to the property prior to um, the conversion. So after, let's say we've issued the RCC as soon as you've hit DOFO, but it still takes three, four months before you before you are able to, to close on the RAD conversion. Um, uh, then we've we spelled out what the PHA is um, supposed to provide uh, uh, to the resident, how to engage with the residents. Uh, before executing the lease. Um, so PJs are, are to provide a RIN, a RAD information notice to residents uh, to let them know, okay, you're, you're being admitted as public housing, uh, but uh, but this property is slated for conversion. Um, uh, you're to provide a, a um, written explanation of the leasing and occupancy changes that will occur after move-in resulting from the RAD conversion. In many cases, there might be None. Um, uh, uh, that that can certainly be arranged, but 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 sometimes that there there will be. Um, and uh, uh, um, as part of the leasing process, meet with each resident to discuss the conversion, explain written materials, and provide uh, residents an opportunity to ask questions. In most cases, this can just be built into the actual uh, uh, leasing process that, that 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 those are happening at the same time as you are meeting with the resident. To sign the lease, you're also explaining um, uh, uh, the, the 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 RAD conversion process and, and, and the materials we're going to be using at that time. Uh, an important note: switching gears uh, to the funding side. So one of the, um, uh, uh, the one of the possibly vexing challenges with fair cloth to RAD conversions is funding in the year the property converts. Um, so as folks are familiar with RAD know, in the year of conversion, RAD projects are funded from, they continue to be funded from public housing operating capital funds in that year, plus the, plus the tenant rents that they collect. So that's a normal RAD conversion. We've been doing that ever since the, the beginning of RAD. And the Section 8 funds start to kick in and the, the um, uh, 
uh, uh, the, the, um, the year, the, the, the first full year after conversion. Um, in fair cost to rat or any, any fair cost development, um, uh, the public housing subsidies don't kick in um, uh, the, immediately. Uh, so for example, the capital fund, um, under the capital fund, a new property doesn't receive capital out, uh, capital fund allocation that year. The PHA doesn't receive capital funds for a new property that year. They don't receive it until the following year. Um, and under the operating fund, depends on, uh, on, on what time of year the property comes online. Generally speaking, if a property comes online within the first half of the year, um, uh, the PHA can, can, can submit a new project submission. Um, uh, 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 by the deadline that's established in an operating fund processing notice. But if it's submitted um, uh, after that deadline, the PHA may go with, might go without any operating fund subsidy for that property in that year. Um, so unfortunately, at this time, that we, we don't have a clean solution to that. Um, uh, it's hard, of course, to time exactly when you'll hit DOFA, when construction will be completed and when a property will, will hit DOFA. Um, if it happens to happen earlier in the year, property can rely on operating funds and tenant rents, and, and maybe that's adequate. If it happens late enough in the year, November, December, um, uh, uh, um, uh, perhaps it's, 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 it's a very small, short period of time to, to, to go without funding. Um, uh, but what we encourage folks to do is to make sure they're building into the budget uh, an initial operating deficit reserve or something of the kind um, to to um, uh, get make sure there's enough enough in the tank for the property to, to operate during this period. And of course, that's just temporary. Beginning uh, January one of the year after conversion, um, uh, HUD provides new funding uh, either to the PHA for PBV conversions or directly on the contract for PBRA conversions to um, uh, the, the, the fund the Section 8 contract rents. Okay, so um, some key considerations. Of course, the, the most basic is how are you going to make the project pencil out? Um, uh, bare cloth to red is not necessarily going to work for everybody, right? You, you, you still have to um, figure out how to raise the capital to uh, uh, get the property built. So that's obviously the, 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 the most critical item. Uh, and then figuring out, you know, what's your development capacity to, um, to uh, deliver the property? What, what, what will you need to partner, bring on capacity to do so? Um, uh, and then some implementation items on uh, what's your what you know what's the timing for uh, the, uh, uh, completing construction and occupying the units? Are you able to structure it so the units will be um, leased up as uh, uh, as as Section Eight, or um, uh, will residents for initially need to be admitted as public housing residents? Um, and then, as I just mentioned. Um, uh, covering any operating deficit in that year of conversion. Some of the key things that we're seeing so far. Uh, before we go to questions, just want to highlight one example. We have a number of great examples of really wonderful properties that um, have been and are being built uh, through Faircloth to Rad. We'll walk through one neat example in Gainesville, Georgia, notably not an MTW agency. Um, uh, uh, that's been able to use fair cloth to add uh, uh, effectively. It's a property called Walton Harbor. Um, uh, so for background, uh, uh, Gainesville is a small town, of just over 42,000 median income uh, of, uh, of, in, in the area is uh, about $54,000 uh, 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 for families. Um, uh, according to odds recent data, 40% of renters in the city are cost burdened and more than 20% are severely cost burdened. Um, years ago, Gainesville previously demolished an aging public housing development through Section 18 um, and have come back and figured out how to, um, through, through a tax credit award, to, to build a mixed income community. Um, and uh, once Faircloth to add became an option, they uh, 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 quickly um, uh, uh, switch gears a little bit to, to incorporate Faircloth to RAD. Um, the result is they're building, or they've built already phase one uh, of an 81 unit uh, rental property. 
uh, where 13 of the units are deeply assisted through Faircloth to RAD. And uh, the rest are, are uh, low-income housing, flash credit, um, income restricted. Um, they used state and federal tax credits, um, uh, a, a loan, a, a soft loan from the PHA, from of capital funds, as well as private loans. Um, built this, built this, built this really beautiful uh, uh, property. They're just, they're very close to closing on phase two, which is also fair cost to rad. Um, uh, with a similar income mix of, of about 81 units and, and, and partially deeply assisted uh, through the fair cost to rad assistance. Uh, right now, this is one of uh, uh, over uh, or exactly 4,359 units currently in the pipeline for fair cost to rad. They're in various stages of this pipeline. Um, so uh, uh, going from right to left, We've got uh, uh, five properties who have uh, uh, are uh, closing their permanent financing and and, and um, have converted or about to convert. Um, so the two in Gainesville and the, uh, one in Baltimore and two in Miami. We've got sixteen properties um, that are in the middle of their construction period uh, or the properties being built, and are, are uh, some of these are uh, just broke ground. So some of them are are really close to being done. Um, we've got seven properties where um, uh, the mixed finance development proposals have been submitted to Belinda and Nick in, in um, the uh, Office of Urban Re Revitalization and are, and are under review. Then we have 52 properties where PHAs have um, uh, requested uh, or have been issued the notice of anticipated rents. So the beginning of the process. And uh, not all of those are going to pan out, right? The PHA have requested the NAR to see what the rents are, um, uh, what what the rad rents would be, and and, and to see if they could make it work. Um, uh, given the constraints with the rad rents, some of them may not work. We're hoping some of the flexibilities that we rolled out in the rad supplemental notice um, uh, uh, for non-MTW agencies, in particular will help more of those uh, 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 get to the finish line and, um, uh, and, and, and expand uh, affordable housing. Um, before we turn to questions, uh, just say we've got some great resources uh, uh, available online. There's a, there's a really strong fair cloth to rad guide, which is about to be updated um, to incorporate some of the supplemental notice changes as well as some other learnings uh, we've, we've gained over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, the mixed finance development uh, uh, process and rules are all available um, on HUD's website. Folks uh, are uh, similarly the, the the RAD rules are are uh, uh, available on on our website. Um, and uh, uh, one one thing we're uh, excited about and we're, we're kind of working on how exactly to deploy. Um, we're hoping to stand up um, some group learning sessions. Um, uh, for PHAs uh, uh, to come together uh, with us and with our technical assistance provider to work through issues together, because we have, we've got a number of PHAs who have gone through the process, we have and are, are in various stages of the process, or are thinking really creatively about about how to get these uh, how to get these deals through. Um, and uh, uh, sometimes they've got uh, even better answers than we do. Um, uh, uh, so uh, we're, we'll look out for that soon. We're, we'll ho hope folks will, will participate. We think we're, they're gonna be really, really valuable. And uh, here's our, our uh, generic email addresses. You of course know our names too. Reach out to Stacy. Reach out to Belinda and Nick in particular uh, for for questions or have issues coming up. Um, uh, they're they're amazing to work with, as as many of you have already learned. Okay, and that's the end of our presentation. And now let's um, let's go to questions. Great, thank you, Will. We do have a lot of questions. Uh, we're so excited to have such an active Q and A. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to go through this in the order that they were received, but trying to connect them together when appropriate. Um, so why don't we start with the very first one. Can fair cloth authority be transferred between public housing authorities? 
Great, thanks. I'll, I'll um, take that for now, which is we haven't figured out a clean way to do that. The, the, um, what we know for now is that PHAs can, um, uh, uh, so a, 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 a PHA can consolidate with another PHA um, uh, in, in total, not just its fair cloth, but it actually be absorbed into another PHA. And when that happens, uh, the fair cloth units transfer as well. Um, we have not yet worked out a way uh, for just fair cloth authority itself to be transferred. Um, not sure if we can get there yet either. Don't want to uh, raise expectations, but it continues to be one of the things on our list uh, to see if we can come up with a way to do. Great, thank you. Um, Matt has asked, could you better define fund additional resources for development? What about funding like vouchers? Are the vouchers or RAD funding for a period or do they sunset? Sure, so when a new property um, is built through Faircloth to RAD, um, HUD provides uh, new funding in, uh, for, if, for a PBV conversion. Um, it pro HUD provides new funding to the PHA's voucher account. That's a permanent new allocation. Um, so as uh, the PHA spends those funds, they become eligible for renewal and that they're, they're, um, and, and those units are permanently added to the PHA's voucher ACC. Um, so it's a, it's a new increment of, uh, of, of, of rental assistance funds um, uh, that, that are provided. Great, thank you. I'm gonna move on uh, to some of the shorter questions and hopefully um, our other panelists have some time to look over at the longer questions that are presented more of like case scenarios um, so we can provide more tailored answers to those. So for now, I'm going to move on to the question presented by Brody Hefner. Does the NAR generally serve the same purpose as the initial, uh, the initial CHAP issued by HUD Recap in other types of RAD projects? Sure. St Stacey, you want to take that one? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Sure. So yeah, that is the intent. So when you have the NAR, you have what the rent schedule is for the unit makeup at the property. So that's what PHAs can use um, to leverage other sources of financing for the project. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have Jennifer Hall shares that the RAD Resource Desk requires um, housing authorities to select either reserve RAD units for fair cloud units or partner with other PHAs. What if they want to do both on the same project? All right. Oh, I think I can take this one too. Um, so selecting, uh, uh, partnering with a PHA is... Uh, hold over from the process that existed previous to the publication of the RAD supplemental notice. So prior to the supplemental notice, PHAs had to either have a portfolio award um, or they had to partner with a PHA that had a portfolio award as a way to reserve units under the RAD cap. So now we don't have to go through that requirement. So that is one of the updates that we're working on that will be rolled out. Um, so you might have seen this um, in a previous conversion, but it no longer actually applies. You don't have to partner with a PHA to reserve any units under Faircloth to RAD, um, it, even if you don't have a portfolio award. It can be a standalone application. Great. Um, we have another question and some more coming in. Um, if a non-MTW agency is on SFMRs, can they use this payment standard in a zip code as a limit for the number to top up to, or can they still only go by 110% um, of the FMR? So um, for agencies that, so uh, this is referencing to the, the maximum amount you can augment the rent, the, the rents yeah. um, uh, uh, up to the, the project-based voucher program caps. So for PHAs that um, are uh, required to use small area FMRs, 
Um, my understanding is uh, that requirement applies to their tenant-based voucher program. Uh, if they want to use small area FMRs uh, for their project-based voucher program, they can opt into that. Uh, it can't be a project-specific decision, though. Um, uh, so they might use a small area FMRs for their whole entire project-based voucher program, in which case that 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 would be the applicable cap. Um, Oh, sorry, uh, my audio was glitching there. Um, one second. So related to that, um, at MF proposal time, PV or PVR decision is requested. Can this be changed later in the process? Stacy? It can. Um, the only uh, thing to be careful about there is um, for PBRA conversions, <clears throat> I think HUD does the Part 50 um, environmental review or Part 58. Um, so if it changes, there may be some implications with respect to the environmental review and making sure that it was done in compliance with the RAD conversion requirements. So uh, it could change some steps we'd have to take between um, the RCCA and the CHAP issuance and RCC. Um, but that's not to say that you couldn't change if you felt that it was more advantageous to switch from your uh, initial selection. I, I, ideally, you'd probably want to pin that down by the time you make the mixed finance development proposal um, slash the, the, um, the initial bad financing plan submission. Um, that would be cleanest. Great. And... Um... We have a broader question here asking if you can go through the thought process that public housing authority should use in selecting to go RAD PVB or RAD uh, PVRA. And maybe you want to provide a brief overview. Uh, we have a couple of webinars uh, on that. So I'm also going to copy those links uh, as an answer to that question. But uh, while I do that, could you please provide a brief overview of that process? Uh, sure, I can start, and if other folks have anything to add, um, uh, for any RAD conversion, even outside of fair cost to RAD, this is a big decision by a housing authority to think about whether to convert to project-based vouchers or to project-based rental assistance. The primary difference being project-based vouchers are administered by the housing authority's voucher program um, with those responsibilities of administering the contract, but also and also the admin fees. Whereas a, a RAD project based rental assistance contract is administered by HUD. Um, for the most part, uh, in virtually all cases, a PHA chooses one and uses that whole approach for their entire portfolio for administrative ease. Um, you know, they're, they're, they, they might be new, learning new program rules and, 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 and don't want to learn multiple new program rules. Um, uh, uh, so, um, we, for most PHAs that have done fair cloth to RAD so far that are participating, they're using whatever, uh, choice they've made, um, w within, um, the RAD conversion process. Um, of course, with the rent flexibilities, uh, now provided in fair cloth to RAD, that might end up driving the decision, right? If the only way you can build a property is by augmenting um, the the rents um, uh, with with half reserves, and and that's the the agency's kind of, uh, policy priority. You might still use RAD project based vouchers, even though the agency might have used um, a PVRA in in other RAD conversions. Since you mentioned rent augmentation, uh, we do have a question. Um, asking if subsequent years get funded at the augmented subsidy levels by the P, uh, PIH. Uh, so, oh, go, go ahead, Stacey, go ahead. Depends on, on um, whether or not you're an MTW agency or, and if you are, whether or not you're one of the original 39 or an expansion MTW agency. So um, for, <clears throat> MTW agencies that are part of the original 39, um, the subsequent years will get funded only at the base NAR rents. But if uh, and you, if you're augmenting RAD rents, 
with the MTW funds, you need to make sure that you have um, adequate funds in that annual MTW fund um, to, to continue augmenting the rents for years one through 20. For non-MTW agencies and um, expansion agencies, uh, the subsequent years after year one, so starting in year two, um, the entire contract rent, including the augmented subsidy um, that was the PHA used from HAP reserves in year one, that gets picked up in their baseline for renewal. Um, so they get funded at augmented levels in years two and beyond. Great, thank you, Stacey. Um, actually, one of the questions that we had below was getting at if a non-MTW PHA is augmenting rent, does the difference definitely have to be fundable out of their HAP reserves or could they find out that money from some other source? Could you clarify that? Well, do you um, wanna... Yeah, so um, uh, hold on, let me just read this question really quickly. Yeah, we'll receive it at 2.02 p.m. Yeah, so thank you, Antonella. Um, yeah, so the initial year or the 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 um for the, the first twelve months, the um uh it would come from the PHA's HAP reserves. So that doesn't mean the PHA has to have HAP reserves available today, because the there's no HAP contract today. There, there there's no payment due today. But by the time the property gets built, the PHA would need to have accumulated the reserves to pay. Um, uh, uh, for, for, for that augmented, um, uh, for those augmented levels. And then like any other um, HAP funds that are expended, uh, the ones recorded in the voucher management system, VMS, they would be eligible for renewal in the subsequent year. Um, so, so that's what you're budgeting for, just for, for, for the initial, um, essentially the, the first 12 months of payments under the contract. Um, I'm going to move on to the, some of the earlier questions. Um, we had a question, I'm guessing it's referring to public housing authorities. If they're not charged taxes at all, do they have to ask for a pilot? Um, their pilot is only $1 per unit per year, but would rather pay $0 if allowed by HUD. And we received that question around 1.30 p.m. for, for yeah. reference. Yeah, so so I we just need the opinion from an attorney that says what your pilot or what your 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 tax responsibility is. Um, some housing authorities have cooperation agreements with their um, uh, local municipalities or their local you know uh, areas, but um, that depending on the area, it may or may not apply to um, a private owner of a mixed finance project. And so we just need a legal opinion to, for that specific um, project or that specific jurisdiction about what applies. Nick, is your volume working? Do you need, do I need to say anything else? Uh, I No, I, I had nothing to add. That was... Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Um, moving on to another question. Um, and we've gotten this in some other webinars too, but could um, any of the panelists answer, um, does the PHA need to submit a site, a neighborhood standards review or analysis for hot review? Belinda or Nick? Yes. The answer is yes. And I believe uh, you've said that that goes to the HUD field office. Yes, uh, so it goes to the local um, PIH director um, in the local field office and they coordinate with the FHNEO office that services that field office. And Belinda, does that happen before they submit the mixed finance development proposal to you or at, at simultaneous? So it depends. 
on how long that jurisdiction. So we've we got housing authorities that do each. Um, some of them submit it simultaneously. Some of them try to get it done ahead of time. Um, but either way, we can't issue our approval letter until um, of the project proposal until we have uh, the memo back from the field office um, approving the site. Um, I recommend doing it as early as possible. Um, we're trying to work right now with FHNEO to um, uh, kind of nail down um, a, a process and um, kind of some framing for submission so that this is a more standardized review and that it doesn't vary so much between field offices. Um, so hopefully that will come out in 2024. Uh, Thanks, Margaret. Great, thank you. Uh, since we're on the topic of field offices, actually there is a question about one of the slides uh, we previously showed asking, um, um, this attendee thought that OPIH architect reviews the project for UFAS accessibility, but the slide stated that the field office would conduct that review. Could uh, no, you that, clarify that? Yeah, you're, um, I'm sorry, I must have missed that on the slide. Um, no, that is, that is correct. It is done by the Office of Public Housing Investments. We do do an architectural review. Um, and we now have three architects on staff. So our, our point was that we just wanted to make sure that um, public housing authorities, especially a lot of them who have um, really just done RAD uh, recently, were aware that that was a requirement. So we wanted to call it out. Great. Thank you. So we do have a lot of questions on non-MTW um, agencies, but before I group, the, I group those together, um, I wanted to get to the question posted at 1.36 p.m. asking if can fair cloud to ride be used in the acquisition of units that don't require new construction or rehab, and how would that change the process of approval? Um, so I think that we are in the process of kind of working out what that would look like. Um, uh, the quick, the quickest and, and quote unquote easiest way to roll this out was um, to frame it initially around new construction. Um, we've recently completed, um, or the Dover Housing Authority has recently completed a project that was an acquisition with substantial rehab. Um, the question that we have to sort of, that we're still teasing out, I think in headquarters and, and we're working with our RAD partners is that we have to make sure that we onboard, you know, a high quality asset that can be sustainable for at least 20 years. Um, and, um, anybody who wants to be a guinea pig to try that, <laughs> to try that out, we're, we're happy to work with you. Will, do you want to add anything? No, that, that, I, I think that's right. And um, uh, just to say, there's a there's a technical distinction too between uh, what makes something "quote unquote" mixed finance, which is within Belinda and Nick's purview, um, and then development outside of mixed finance. And, and just to clarify, mixed finance really means anything that's not directly owned by the housing authority. It could be the housing authority's instrumentality or affiliate or um, uh, uh, whatever, but, uh, uh, or, or cash credit partnership. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, all of that comes under the, the purview of mixed finance. Um, and indeed, so, uh, we're, we're grappling with, all right, what's the appropriate review for, uh, um, uh, property that, that falls there. Um, but that, um, where, where the PHA is saying, I, I, I've got a property, um uh or i can i can i can acquire this property um and uh, but i don't intend to do any rehab on that well we, we obviously would want to make sure that the, the property doesn't need rehab uh before onboarding it great thank you so um going back to the questions related to non-mtw agencies 
um, you talked about the augmentation portion um, of the FDR rent paid from the agencies have preserved for the first year. Um, I think we covered that. Um, but the two questions that I think we have not covered are, is the agency's portion paid from tab reserve funds only, or is it taken from the total annual funding allocation to the agency for its Section 8 program? Um, and similarly, just asking if the non-MTW agencies will need to use um, for amending an existing NAR with augmented rents. Uh, so I could take the first one, um, which is the um, uh, the short of it is a, a PHA yeah needs to have eligible app funds uh, to pay for the, the augmented piece of the rent, the, the 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 piece that we aren't providing a new increment of funds for. Um, so uh, um, we use the word HAP reserves, but if it's uh, 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 the current funding that the, the you know, or, or, um, uh, 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 this year's funding of, uh, uh, of voucher funds that the PHA has available, um, those work, um, that, that, that works as well. Um, and then I'm not sure I caught the second part of the question. Did, did, um, uh, did, did, uh, did somebody else in, were they able to answer or do we need to repeat it? Yeah, can can you repeat the second part? Yeah, um, they are asking if we could elaborate on the process that non MTW agencies will need to use for amending an existing NAR with augmented rents. Got it. Okay. Uh, uh, Stacy, can, can you talk through that or what they so for do? if you have an existing NAR and uh, you want to amend you want to augment the rents, you can just contact us and let us know how much you want to augment them up to the 110% of FMR and we can issue a revision to the NAR so you don't have to start a new request. Great, thank you. Um, I did see another couple of questions about the NAR, so let me just jump to those. Um, actually, I think you just answered this one. Um, so let me move on to um, a different topic. Um, can the PHA work with a private developer that will be the eventual owner and the PHA will only be the voucher administrator for a fair cloud uh, to rat development? So the property, because it'll be a RAD conversion, the property will need to meet RAD's ownership and control requirements, which require that a public or nonprofit entity have an ownership or control stake um, in the property. Um, and that could be met a number of different ways, but it can't simply be that the, there's a, the, the housing authority is administering the contract. Um, so for example, in Philadelphia, they're, I know they're working with a number of nonprofit developers um, and, and and that will satisfy the, the RAD requirement. So uh, you can take a look at the RAD ownership and control requirements in the RAD notice to see the various um, uh, ownership uh, structures that, that would work. Um, and I'll just add to that because I see another question that, uh, similar along those lines. So even though the RAD ownership <clears throat> requirements apply um, when you're applying through the um, mixed finance development process. The PHA doesn't have to be the sole owner and developer. So the mixed finance rules allows for um, different ownership entities, um, which are acceptable so long as it meets the RAD ownership requirements. Great. Thank you. Um, since we're on the on that topic, I guess um, we had a question just coming in um, asking if we could expand about the ownership requirements. Um, a like tech development generally has only a small percentage owned by a nonprofit or a PHA. Would that be an issue? 
Uh, no, in most cases, no. As long as the a nonprofit, the nonprofit or the housing authority is a is a uh, 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 the um, general partner or the managing member, uh, um, or there are other ways. Um, again, uh, um, I don't have them all off the top of my head, but they're they're well articulated um, in the RAD notice, and you can see the various ways a, a PHA or nonprofit may not may have a small ownership stake in a property but has a uh, um, uh, substantial con um, control stake. Um, and, and that accommodates lots of tax credit scenarios. Great. Um, since you just provided uh, an example, there's also a request for an example to know how long to expect it to take from uh, DOFA to RAD close in. In a non cloud rat closings, we uh, we see many months in between steps that require DOFA. For example, uh, take screenshot and RCC closing. Um, could you talk more about that process? Uh, Stacy, you want to talk a little bit through the through the process of the from, from DOFA to closing? Yeah. <clears throat> so we. We have, since we've only had a few properties close, um, we've had a couple of PHAs that leased up their building um, and then converted. So their closing timeline was um, a bit longer, but um, as long as the PHA is um, ready with closing documents, as soon as the property achieves DOFA um, and we can issue the RCC, they go right into closing. We we can conduct our, re our closing review and close within that same month. Um, so it really just depends on the PHA's intent um, and whether they want to close right away and delay their lease up until after the rod conversion. Um, we hear a lot of PHAs say that that is their preference um, so that they can just lease up as Section 8 and not have to move residents in as public housing residents. Um, and so we have projects that are coming online um, towards the end of this year that we anticipate will do exactly that. But um, as far as an average timeline uh, for that window, uh, we just don't have the pipeline to to really uh, give you an average. Um, and the one that we do, the ones that we have have just been situations where the PHA decided um, they needed to lease up um, prior to the RAD closing. Right. Um, yeah, actually, one of the attendees posed a question related to this. Um, it says, if we need to lease units prior to rod conversion, and we provide appropriate notice as detail, um, are residents required to income qualify twice at initial occupancy as PH, and then after rod conversion, or can they simply just sign the PVV lease document? They're asking so they can meet the tax credit requirements and qualify for a full year lease. Yeah, and that is generally what we had seen with the closing so far. So they, um, you, you won't have to recertify residents um, at the point in time which you complete the RAD conversion. They'll have to sign uh, the Section Eight lease, um, but a lot of times what we advise PHAs is if they're going to lease up before the RAD closing. Um, when they do their move-in consultation with the residents, and you can can you can communicate to them at that point in time what the conversion plans are and what to expect as far as the changes in their um, lease when the property does convert to Section Eight, um, and that can be satisfied uh, through that initial um, move-in process. So it it might. Um, it, it does allow the PHA to satisfy their tax credit requirements, but what we have seen is that then pushes their RAD closing date out a little bit further, maybe um, two months, I think, was um, the most recent one we saw was between RCC and, and closing. And, and just to add, I think this is consistent with, or possibly answer some of the other questions. Um, legally, a property could convert uh, as soon as, you know, uh, uh, the, the next day after uh, a property reaches DOFA. Um, and, uh, but the only way to do that is if the PHA makes sure it's updated its financing plan to make sure that's final. 
um, as, as needed, but also started to submit or submitted its closing uh, package to us, uh, which can happen before construction is fully completed. Um, there, there's nothing preventing that. Um, uh, we haven't yet seen it done, uh, 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 um, as, as Stacy said, um, but it, uh, it it certainly is possible if a PHA is sufficiently motivated and has its ducks in a row to put its closing package together to um, uh, uh, for 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 the conversion to happen very shortly after um, the the property hits its DOFA date. I do, um, and we do have some time. We have time until 3 p.m. to try to get to all of your questions. Um, but there's just one quick clarification that I would like the panelists to make. Um, one of our attendees has pointed out that in the slides, it was stated that the PHA had to lease to 95% um, to get the DOFA, but it seems now uh, in these answers that we have provided, that we're saying that um, PHAs do not need to get 95% lease up to convert. Could you not clarify lease. that? Yeah, it's not 95% lease up, it's that 95% of the units have received certificates of occupancy from the local building official. So um, not that they have executed leases, but um, that they're ready for occupancy. That's when you achieve the actual DOFA date. Belinda, I saw you come off mute. Anything else to add there? No, no, I was, that's exactly correct. Thank you. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, since we were in the topic of closing, um, Nicole Jackson has left question here. To prepare for a quick RAD conversion closing process, is there any guidance on what changes need to be reflected? Um, like key transaction documents, uh, like the owner's site partnership agreement and the management documents in order to expedite the closing process. Um, this question was posed at 154 for reference if, if reading the question itself is easier. Um, I don't know if we have a specific answer for you right now, Nicole. Of course, the, the standard RAD closing documents um, that are in uh, in our closing checklist would need to be um, uh, need to be submitted. So um, uh, uh, we need to analyze that to say, well, we'll uh, so of course, any submission would would, would need to uh, uh, satisfy the, those 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 requirements. Um, uh, so whatever the future ownership of um, uh, organization is um, and, and, and management documents would need to satisfy kind of the, the standard RAD requirements. And if those are changing from what um, uh, was in the original mixed finance development proposal, that's fine. Um, uh, and if they're staying the same, then you can, you can reuse the, 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 those same items. Yeah, um, seems like there was sort of a clarification on that question. Um, another attendee has said that the question Nicole was asking about was with respect to contemplating. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I think, so, yeah, so contemplating. I think, yeah, so I think I know the, the source of this question. So the, the question is, we've had a couple law firms that have tried to blend the closing documents where they've tried to include within the mixed finance closing transaction, the requirements that also sort of like check the box for the RAD. And um, our OGC has determined that you, we, we can't do that, like that we really need to have a public housing closing that addresses the nature of us developing a public housing document and a public housing unit um, and all of the governances that cover that, and then that RAD is their own closing. So right, so right now we don't have a blended process. I, I think that's the driver of that question. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, now, switching gears a little bit, um, in regard to site and neighborhood standards, um, we got a question, uh, just one second, every time a new question comes in, uh, things move around for me a little bit. Um, so in regard to site and neighborhood standards, um, one of our attendees says that it's our understanding that by statute, statute uh, PHAs can rebuild public housing back on site, even if the site is in a minority concentrated census tract up to 50% of the original account. So in the first uh, part of the transaction, does that apply as well? And then um, when, when the rat transaction takes place, it's, it is existing housing, so the minority concentration should not be an issue, correct? That's a long question, so it just for reference for our panelists uh, that was submitted uh, by Jaime uh, 213, if you want to read off the text here. So, um, so I think the, the question is on the site and neighborhood standards requirements um, and the exceptions that are permitted in the um, uh, Sort of, sort of in the waiver there. So th there's there's more than one exception. One exception is if you're building on an existing public housing site, um, you can, with respect to minority concentration, build up to 50% um, of the previous uh, total number of public housing units that were on that site. Um, there's also an exception for like overriding housing need. And I think we're working on like how to define that with FHNO a little bit to get some clarity. But yes, those provisions would still um, apply. I think that if you wanted to, depending on your specific situation, I mean, we have been able to work with FHNO to show like where neighborhoods are undergoing you know, transformation and other changes. So it's, it's just really dependent on what the characteristics of that particular site are in its surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and, and Will, I don't know how that also impacts the, on the RAD side. I thought you just deferred to that's right. the site neighborhood standards approval that's uh, completed through the mixed finance process. That's right. So again, going back to the principle that the the rad conversion is really a conversion of an existing just built property. So it's a straight conversion. We're not. It's not a, a new construction proposal from the rad perspective. So all of the development requirements um, that apply to mixed finance um, apply, and and the rad development requirements uh, 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 don't apply. Thank you. Um, before I move on to some of the other questions, actually someone requested that Stacy um, could recap one of, yeah, if you could please repeat what you said about eligibility for fair cloth to red in instances where a PBR, PBRA project is located in an opportunity zone. Yeah, so this is an existing RAD rent um, <clears throat> flexibility that is um, in the RAD notice, I think section 1.7 um, that we had referenced on the slide. So if a property is located in an opportunity zone, we can provide up to $100 per unit per month um, for that property. There's um, a financial necessity analysis that we do if a PHA is interested in using that rent flexibility. So if um, we have a property that's a PBRA, they want to use that, we can, um, we'll let, you know, they reach out to us directly. We'll um, let you know what information we need um, as it pertains to um, the financial necessity barrier that we need to establish, but you could check out um, our RAD notice that's revision for section 1.7a. Um, uh, I don't remember the full, um, the complete reference to the notice, but it's in the slides that we'll update and publish. Great, thank you. And then we have a couple of questions uh, related to funds. 
Um, first one, are you allowed to use state non-federal funds um, designated by a legislative body to augment or top off the fair call to rat? Uh, no, the uh, only uh, voucher funds, uh, because you're essentially, the funds are being used to pay on a HAP contract. You're going to be signing a HAP contract, a project-based voucher HAP contract for higher rents. Um, and so only funds that are eligible to be used to pay on a HAP contract um, uh, can be used. So that has to be a PHA's, um, uh, uh, from a PHA's voucher program. Uh, other funds provided by a legislative body or, or state or local funds or other, other grants, they're, they're, those can be used as, as development sources or uh, to create established reserves, uh, particularly like the initial reserve that we commented uh, will in many cases be necessary. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but but can't be used to fund the augmented rent the, the augmented rent levels. Great, thank you. Um, can fair cloud funds be mixed into resignation deal? So either ne neither new units nor public housing. Oh, I'm sorry, the warden. Um, I cannot really see the question fully. I assume platforms kind of glitchy, but this was submitted at I believe one fifty one. If one of the panelists can navigate to that question as I troubleshoot my issue with the Q and A. So, so fair, yeah. So fair cloth doesn't come with funds. Fair cloth are actual units. Um, it said be mixed into a resyndication deal. So I'm assuming that may be. Um, we think that there may be a market for housing authorities to purchase expiring um, uh, tax credit projects that have reached the end of their 15-year tax credit compliance. Um, if that were the case, I mean, I think it would be an acquisition with maybe some uh, some rehab there. Um, and we, I think that would be eligible. We did that, I believe, in Dover. Um, if, if that's what you're talking about, Will, do you have a different spin? No, that, that, that sounds right to me, Belinda. Okay. Okay. Now, we have a question just asking, how does the process differ, if any, for existing projects going through a substantial rehab? I'm not sure which process specifically this question is referring to. I, I'm assuming it's a question of uh, comparing new construction versus an existing property with substantial rehab. Um, and this is uh, the, the scenario that, that, that Belinda uh, described earlier with, with Dover. So we, we, we've done one of these um, where uh, an existing property that's going to go through substantial rehab um, uh, 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 goes through fair call thread. Um, Belinda, any thoughts on, you know, are there any substantial differences that folks should should be looking out for in the process? Um, no, but, you know, with the substantial rehab, I mean, again, the UFAS had to be met, you know, all the site neighborhood standards had to be met. But, um, I mean, we think it's a, a great opportunity for PHAs to explore um, as, as a tool to maybe bring some additional units um, onto the, to their por portfolio. Um, and often a substantial rehab can be accomplished with a 4% bond versus uh, new construction typically needs the 9% tax credits. And so um, I, I think it's a way to, to market or a way to look, so. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions related to the percentage of FMR. FMR. Um, so let me start with this one posted at 2.08 p.m. If an agency has opted into small area FMRs and has been approved to have BPS that goes up to 120%, of FMR, 
can the augmented rents go up to 120 uh, percent and can it go up to the limit for the small area in which the project is located? Uh, so I think I know the answer to this. If I understand the question correctly, um, uh, so PHAs can uh, re um, uh, request approval for a, um, a higher payment standard for certain zip codes. Um, and if a PHA has been approved for the highest higher payment standard for a specific zip code for the voucher program, that would apply to both tenant-based and project-based vouchers. Um, and and therefore it, it, it could apply here. Jeff, let, let us know if we hit the mark there. We can continue by email if if, if, uh, if we need more detail. Great, thank you. Um, so we had a question earlier. Uh, we had talked about close out a close in on, on how long um, that kind of takes uh, to process but someone asked earlier how long does the process take to complete the rod conversion after construction completion are PHAs and developers able to start the conversion process prior to construction close out uh, yes uh, and we encourage it um... Uh, so the, again, the, uh, in, in theory, it's possible to have the conversion happen very quickly um, after the property becomes public housing. Um, we haven't seen it yet to date, but, um, uh, but, a, but a PHA can submit its closing package uh, before the property, before the construction is completed. Um, and we can, uh, uh, and if, if, if a, you know, a, a full closing package could tee up a very quick, uh, a very quick round conversion. Great. Um, we have another attendee that asked when a public housing authority is doing a transaction that would result in a close out of their public housing program, do they still gain fair cloud units that they can develop prior to closing out the public housing program? For instance, if a PHA with 40 units left in their public housing portfolio is doing the 50 and under small PHA for section 18, are 40 units added to their fair cloud authority? Stacey, you wanna take that one? Mm, yes, yeah, so the um, 40 units that went through Section 18, um, those would be added to their, um, back to their fair cloth authority. And PIH just recently issued guidance that if they're using one of these um, <clears throat> streamlined conversion processes for 50 and under and small PHAs, um, that generally would require the PHA to close out their public housing program if they have plans that they can demonstrate to use those 40 units that went back into their available Faircloth authority, uh, HUD will delay the closeout of the ECC um, and allow them to pursue the uh, development and um, you could use those 40 units for a Faircloth to ride conversion. Okay, so um, earlier uh, we we receive um, kind of a longer question um, here at one fourteen. Uh, the experience of a housing authority saying that they have tried to contemplate fair cloth to RAD in closing documents, uh, for example, upon RAD conversion, um, these provisions change from X to Y. However, the housing authority has maintained that RAD cannot be contemplated in closing documents aside from a very basic reference to fair cloth to RAD. Um, this undermines the program if documents need to be redone and renegotiated at conversion and seems to conflict with guidance. Uh, could you please clarify co if conversion can be done in a way that avoids a need to amend later? So 
the, the documents have to meet the requirements to become a public housing unit. And the documents that we've seen so far where they've tried to blend really were like a blending of kind of like two closing requirements that they were trying to address with one. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, I, I you know, I, I don't think that there's a workaround uh, that right now. I don't know. Will, do you have any other insight on? Yeah, no, I, um, we, we'd love to explore this issue a little bit more. We can't, we can't promise that there is a very satisfying answer, but we're, we're, we're certainly committed to, to working on it if we can find a, if we can find a way. So um, if you can send us, um, just, just re reach out to us separately over email um, and and we're, we're we're happy to 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 dive a little bit deeper with you and 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 uh, and then work with with our uh, ODC partners internally to see if if there's something that can be done to make it a little bit easier. Yeah, actually, well, can you um, go back one slide so you have the um, email addresses on screen? Great, thank you. Um, I think this is a broad question uh, presented by Marilyn Harris at 1.49 p.m. What are the cons of doing this? I'm, I'm guessing referring to the fair cloud to rat development um, from a PHA perspective. For you here on the spot, I know you're, you're talking positively about the development. We're definitely here for that but is there anything that you would add or or say about that from a uh, public housing authority's perspective what could be challenging about going for this uh, I, I can start and then pass on to others so for one thing you you have to work with us um uh and we can be difficult sometimes so we apologize in advance for that um uh, but seriously, the you know we, we've tried to highlight some of the places folks have tripped up um so there's Funding the property in the year of conversion, um, uh, it needs to be but typically it will need to be budgeted for. There's the question of lease up and and the timing there because um, folks have it's frustrating to have to sign leases for public housing leases for residents and then go back to those residents and say never mind we're, gonna, we're not never mind but hey let, let let's go and and switch over those leases right that's that's a lot of administrative work. Um, uh, uh, and then, of course, there's you still have to figure out how to develop the property and 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 put that together. So, so um, the, the, those are the really the the the, the um, at least a few of the biggest issues that that um, I've seen. Stacy, Belinda, Nick, anything you want to add? Yeah, I I mean, I think it is a challenge when you sort of when you layer two different programs together to try to get one outcome. Um, I would say that one challenge would be that you're probably dealing with lower rents, which we've tried to add some provisions to bolster that. Um, again, development isn't easy on its face um, without having to explain, you know, kind of like two programs to your investors and your lenders. Um, and that's why we were hoping that the you know, that the NARS letter provides um, a level of assurance um, about the income for the property. I've heard that the legal expense um, for kind of like two closings um, is, is high, but I still think it's cheaper than developing and operating a public housing and then going through a complete RAD conversion. Um, so, and maybe we should ask that of next time we have PHAs on the call uh, who've, who've gone through it to sort of share their experience. And, and that's one of the goals of the, the group learning um, sessions that um, spoke through earlier. So, you know, there, there are some agencies that have gone through this and hit some of the pain points and know for their next one to, to avoid them. Um, and uh, there's, we can all learn from, from them. Um, so uh, one of the things to look out for um, in, in the future as, as, we, uh, as, as we roll that out. 
Thank you. Uh, there are several questions. I think some of them um, kind of re refer to each other, but we have been asked to confirm that the NARS are issued for all qualifying projects, aka there isn't a competitive screening at that stage. Um, and this attendee would also like to confirm that it sounds like if everything is in order, uh, it is likely to take something like a month post request to get an art issue. We yes, are, right. yeah, our target is closer to like two weeks turnaround um, once we have the information that we need. Um, but in some instances, it's taken a little bit longer just depending on capacity or reaching out to OPHI and they're talking to the capital fund. So there's different pieces that go into it. But um, generally, we work towards a, a two week turnaround. And, and to confirm, there, there, it's not a competitive process. It's no. Right. Do you have fair cloth units? Yes. OK, that's all it is. OK, thank you. Um, I'm just marking that as answered. OK, so also in the line of um, just asking about NARS, um, one of the attendees mentioned that in one of her slides, you talked about the timing of the flow of subsidy for new projects and that they are not eligible to not receive capital funds in the first year, only operating subsidies for that first year. How does that subsidy level relate to the base NAR rents approved for the property. Will the first year NAR rents actually be lower in the first year than documented in the base NAR approved rent level? Uh, is there a potential timing delay in the property receiving subsidy in the first year, depending on when funds are requested? Yeah, so, so the funding in the year of conversion, um, it is tricky because there's a cutoff date in which you have to have your property online in order to receive any operating fund that's in the year of conversion. So if you uh, complete construction in the middle of 2024 and um, you you meet the deadline that's usually around June something, um, if you're if you've received your DOFA by by that deadline, then you will receive operating fund. Um, subsidies for the remaining portion of the year in which you're converting. Um, however, no properties will receive capital fund in that year that they convert, that first year that they come online. Um, and also, if they don't meet that deadline for operating fund, they don't get any operating fund in that first partial year that they convert. Um, but that doesn't affect the subsidy that kicks in with all RAD conversions, Section 8 HAP payments begin on January 1st, um, the first full year after conversion. Um, so the um, there's a greater need for reserves in the year of conversion, operating reserves in the year of conversion when that property is coming online because there's some uncertainty as to whether you will get any operating funds and how much depending on what the timing is of your completion. Um, but again, that doesn't that doesn't affect uh, the subsidy that gets paid starting January one after um, the uh, the first year after conversion. So that first year is when subsidy payments um, kick in for the base NAR amount that includes whatever capital and operating fund uh, that was estimated in the NAR. Anything to add to that, Will? Okay, I just want to flag that um, we only have about six minutes left. Um, we still have about 18 questions to answer. So uh, folks, we might not get to your question, uh, but the team um, isn't always in the habit of either following up via email or putting together a series of gridden answers to each question that he shared with all participants. So that knowledge you know, is public to all of you who have attended. Um, so do not worry if we do not get to your question um, during the next six minutes. Uh, before we move on from the NAR issue, uh, is there a way to determine what the RAD rents would be prior to requesting a NAR? 
Uh, could the PHAs look at operating subsidy for sites within the portfolio plus estimated tenant portion? Uh, would that be a good proxy? Um, so a good proxy is if you know what your regular RAD rents are, they're usually 10 or 20 percent um, below that. Um, Antonella, what, what time did that uh, question come in just so I can look at it? Yeah, it's all the way up around okay. 1 14 p.m. Um, and so <clears throat> it also asks whether there's no capital fundings because it's not an existing building. That's actually not true. We do get a capital fund estimate. It's just typically very low. Um, so it might be like $100 per unit per month. Um, the caveat is that no properties get a uh, capital fund in the year in which they come online. So they don't get capital fund the first year, uh, that partial year, um, but they do get a capital fund estimate that would be part of their ongoing subsidy that is new based on the NAR. Great. Thank you, Stacey. And then um, just some very little questions um, to get to those. Um, can proceeds from a Section 18 disposition be used to fund RAD conversion in year one before the Section 8 funds kick in? Sure. So uh, for PHA has Section 18 proceeds that can be used typically for any public housing or Section 8 purpose, uh, including Section 8 development. Um, so in this case, it's essentially using the proceeds and putting it into um, the RAD sources and uses to say source is the, the Section 18 proceeds, use is to establish uh, operating reserve. Um, and, uh, and, and that would, that, that's what would appear in, within the RAD, RAD financing plan. I saw Belinda coming off mute. Belinda, did you want to add anything else? No, I, I concur with what Will said. There, there are a few exceptions if, if your letter on those Section 18 um, proceeds have some use restrictions, but by and large, the majority of them do say for uh, Section 8 or 9 purposes. Okay. Um, is there a reason a PHA would choose to lease up units as public housing rather than wait for RAD conversion to lease up units as Section 8? I think the biggest thing is if they, if one of their funders requires them to, right, that you have, you have these, these carrying costs of an of a unleased property and you might have um, uh, uh, requirements of tax credit uh, in their tax credit award or whatever to, to, to lease up by a certain time. Um, and, and, you, and you, for whatever reason, can't wait for, for the RAD conversion to, uh, to, to be completed. So most PHAs try to avoid that. Um, uh, but in some cases, if, um, if uh, the, there's delays in getting the closing package to us or, or, or whatever, um, uh, it might mean that conversion happens a few months after the properties are uh, in pick in in, pub in the public housing program, in which case those PHAs might might start leasing up. Okay, hey, thank you. Well, um, I had a question coming directly to you just a couple minutes ago. Um, and this might be the last question that we'll get to. Um, since the FDR rents are so low, FMR rent, I suppose, uh, isn't it likely that many residents who ultimately lease these units will be zero HAP families? If so, should the PHA apply for waiver to admit zero HAP residents at the RAD application stage? Uh, so uh, this is mixing uh, 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 various advanced RAD themes, but yeah, it's possible that uh, uh, with the lower RAD rents, um, uh, there might be some families that are admitted that where, where their incomes are higher, um, uh, such that 30% of their income is actually higher than, than, than the RAD rent. Uh, in which case, yeah, they, could, they, they can apply for that, the, the exception for zero hat families. It's still not going to happen that much because we're talking about lower rad rents, but um, but not you know they're generally five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars um, 
uh, not 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 two three four hundred dollars. Um, so so most residents, most um, uh, 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 hot assisted residents would would still um, uh, re require some subsidy under these rents. That's still a, a, a good flag. Okay, um, we have a related question uh, that came in at two forty one p.m. Um, on, the term, on eligibility determination, but we are at 3 p.m. I, I do want to be respectful of uh, people's time, especially our panelists and the people who have joined the session. Uh, I will leave it up to you, Will. Do you want to get to that question before leaving or um, would you be following up via email? I, I think we'll need to follow up over email. Um, Great. But I'm super excited that everybody's asking so many questions. So um, we are... We are, we're, we're grateful for your participation and, and sticking with us. Yes, thank you for your time today. Um, you'll get notification that the materials have been posted on how to change in about two weeks. You'll receive a survey link right after this session. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day.